Okay then everyone, um, welcome to the um, webinar. Um, we'll start now. Um, welcome to this LMI in Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Dissemination webinar. My name is Paul Morgan and I'm the Sector Development Specialist responsible for sectors activities in Wales. As a result of this project, SEMTA in cooperation with Miller Research have produced research studies, learning and development strategies and evaluation reports in order to provide a stronger evidence base and more detailed labour market intelligence to better understand the issues of supply chain and supply and demand when targeting training to employers and to inform planning and funding decisions of both government and training providers. As part of the project, the project aim is to carry out and deliver research for the advanced materials and manufacturing se sector to determine emerging technology and skills related requirements, numbers employed in advanced materials and manufacturing, provide the capacity and capability to deliver skills solutions in Wales, comparisons made to UK regions, comparisons made to global industrial areas that the advanced materials and manufacturing is a key sector and threat, issues and barriers faced by employers in upskilling their employees in technology skills, and finally barriers faced by training providers in delivering for the sector. If you have any questions throughout the LMI and webinar, um, if you'd like to keep them um, to the end and write the questions in the little chat box on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, and myself um, and Sam will answer the questions at the end of the webinar. So without any further ado, um, I'd like now to introduce Sam White, Senior Researcher from Miller Research, to take you through the findings of the LMI project. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the first slide that we've got provides uh, an overview of how we're going to run this uh, webinar. So Paul's just given us a quick introduction. Um, I'm going to talk you through a bit more about the research. Paul has just gone through a few of uh, the aims and objectives, but I'll just quickly go through them as well, just for completeness. Then I'll take you to the key findings. Uh, we've got about 30 slides, so I'm hoping it's going to take about 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, and we've got as long as, as long as you've got questions for then. First thing we're going to look at is a profile of the advanced manufacturing uh, material sector. We'll then look at forecasts and skills that this needs, and we'll briefly touch on provider capacity and capability. Uh, and as you can see there, we'll, we'll enter on to questions and discussions. So like Paul says, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat box. We'll have a look at them as we go through and then answer them at the end. So first section about the research. Um, as Paul mentioned, we were commissioned, Miller Research were commissioned to carry out a skills research study into the advanced manufacturing sector. The aim for this, the ultimate aim is that uh, we'd like it to inform skills policy um, and development going forward um, to understand what the emerging technologies, skills related requirements are. We're trying to put some numbers on it, so we're trying to take the analysis further from just understanding what skills are needed, but also trying to forecast what those skills needs are in terms of numbers. So we'll have a look at that. And as I mentioned, looking also at provider capability and capacity, and also touching on any issues and barriers that we've um, that employers and training providers currently face in the industry. So before we get started, just a quick overview of the definition. Uh, in a nutshell, what we are looking at um, is the value chain, which ranges from the initial manufacture and wholesale of uh, primary materials through to the construction of complex electrical, mechanical, engineering products. So it is all encompassing uh, advanced manufacturing, and you can see on that slide the full list of um, subsectors of advanced manufacturing and materials that we consider. Uh, for those interested in the research side of it, we've got a long list of standard industry classification codes that um, sit behind this, and that's what we use to sort of pull all the data together. Uh, this also is uh, CEMTA's footprint, so CEMTA, the Set Skills Council, this is their footprint, and so that's what governed the um, definition for this study. Very quickly, just going through our approach, uh, there are two main um, sides the, the research that we did. We did uh, qualitative research and some quantitative research. The qualitative research was entirely desk-based um, and it comprised a review of existing information 
um, that we could find so looking at policies, skills policies, anything that provided some contextual background to uh, the skills study, uh, as well as any other research that could give us an insight into what else had been done. Uh, we also carried out some stakeholder engagement, some interviews with some key stakeholders. So we looked at, uh, we, we interviewed some of the uh, key forums active in the sector, the automotive, the airspace, and the electronics forums, uh, as well as some other sort of Welsh government and other key stakeholders. Uh, the main part of the survey then was this quantitative um, online survey that we did. So we, we, got, um, we prepared quite an in-depth skills-based survey uh, that we sent out to employers. Uh, and this was asking some in-depth questions about uh, the skills needs. We supported this with some interviews with training providers, uh, mainly FE, further education providers. Um, we also did case studies with uh, six key employers across Wales. So we tried to get representative of the, um, each region in Wales and also across sector of the subsectors within the definition that we just saw previously. And then the analysis, which I'm about to take you through then, uh, we used national data sets and survey data that was available. And as I mentioned, we um, defined it using standard industry classification code, so we could do that. So the first thing to look at then, the key findings, this is section two. Um, just some two things to note first, uh, some sort of key points from this. Uh, the sector, the advanced manufacturing sector in Wales is a high value sector. In terms of employment, it accounts for 6% of all Welsh labour, but it contributes 17% to turnover. So you can see there's a huge difference between the proportion of people um, employed and the amount that they contribute to turnover generation. It's also a high growth sector. So between 2008 and 2011, the sector grew 19%, which um, is, is very high over a period coming out of the recession, but also compared to manufacturing, general manufacturing, uh, the growth was 16%. So this would suggest that advanced manufacturing and materials businesses are outperforming the, um, the manufacturing counterparts. So to look at this in a bit more detail, firstly we'll look at employment. So this information is taken from the Business Register and Employment Survey, so that's available from the Office of National Statistics. And as you can see there, um, employment is uh, in advanced manufacturing and materials in Wales is just over 80,000, 81,381. As mentioned previously, that's 6% of the total Welsh labour force. So if you look at that graph, you can see all of the different broad industry classifications on the left-hand side, and then the bar indicates how many people are employed in each of those sectors. So you can see the relative uh, comparison of advanced manufacturing and materials. If you look at manufacturing, it's the third highest in Employer, industry employer in Wales, and of that, some 52% of those third bar down is made up uh, by advanced manufacturing materials. So you can see that it is, a, it is an important part, component of the Welsh labour market. Looking at if we put this down by sectors, you'd see that um, employment by sector is particularly important in Wales for metals, mechanical automotive and aerospace. And I mention that now because it will, we'll see that that becomes a little bit important to go on. Um, it's more important relative to other uh, regions of the uh, Great Britain as well. So for Wales, um, a larger proportion of advanced manufacturing and materials employment is taken up by those employed in the metals, mechanical and aerospace sector. Um, comparatively, there are less employees in other engineering activities and research and development. So taking this analysis further, we'll look at that. We'll look at employment by regions. And so what we've done here is to plot uh, the 11 regions of Britain in terms of the uh, number of employees in the advanced manufacturing and materials sector. And we also look at the regional economy as well. And then on the right-hand side of that table, you can see the proportion of employment in the region that's taken up. So you can see they're highlighted in red is Wales. Uh, it currently sits tied sick on 6.4%, so that's the 6% I quoted before, so it's actually 6.4%, so we needed to go down to the decimal places to look at the relative um, import, uh, relative size. The Great Britain average as a whole is 5.7%, so again you can see that on average, uh, compared to the rest of Great Britain, the advanced manufacturing sector is relatively important for Wales. It's also worth pointing out that the 6.4% for Wales is just 0.2% away from fourth place. 
So just a slight increase in the number of people employed in the sector could see its relative importance for Wales jump up on this comparison graph um, table. Uh, and it, it equates for Wales for about 2,500 extra employees would see it just jump up in importance. Um, however, it's also worth, point, worth pointing out that if you look at the total number of employment in each of the regions, then Wales at 81 uh, is the second least um, uh, highest employer in absolute terms behind the North East at 67,800. So even though it's very important for Wales, uh, comparatively to the region um, in terms of absolute size, there's still some work to be done. So quickly just have a look at the um, total number of businesses. So what the research found was that uh, just less than 5,000 VAT registered businesses, and so this is using the inter the, uh, inter Interdepartmental Business Register, again from the uh, Office of National Statistics, and this is tw uh, 2013 data. Um, that accounts for 4% of all advanced management businesses in the UK as a whole, um, or if you look at it in terms of just the Welsh economy, it's 5% of all Welsh businesses. So again, it is an important sector in terms of employment and the number of businesses. If we look at the breakdown by sector, which is what you can see on the graph at the moment, you can see that uh, metals, automotive and aerospace are relatively more important than the UK equivalent, given that the purple um, bar at the top is, um, shows that there's a greater proportion of businesses in those subsectors compared to the UK. So for metals, you can see the graph, um, it's just about 25% for uh, Welsh businesses. Uh, and it's more like 22% for the UK. Same for aerospace and automotive and this as well. So these are more important um, sectors. Okay, so now we'll move on to turnover. Um, as I mentioned at the start, um, there was 70% of all turnover uh, in Wales, as a whole Welsh economy, uh, comes from the advanced manufacturing sector. Um, that's about 19 billion, it's actually 18.9 billion uh, pounds worth of turnover, and this is 2011 data, and that's all that's available. If you look at GDA, uh, for Wales, um, Wales advanced manufacturing sector uh, uh, contributes 9% of all turnover. The GP equivalent is 7%, so it shows that for Wales, um, advanced manufacturing is a high value and an important sector. If we look at the breakdown of this, you can see that um, the electronics, uh, the automotive and the um, metal sector each account for a third of all turnover. If you add to that mechanical sector, then it goes up to 88% of all turnover is from these three sectors. If we go back to where I mentioned the employment breakdown and the uh, number of businesses, we particularly important uh, in aerospace, the automotive and the metal sector. If we look at those, uh, just to read what, to what um, contributions that they make to overall turnover, we're talking about 59%. The comparative figures for the other regions of uh, Great Britain are 38% in England and 25% in Scotland. So you can see 59% in Wales, it is a huge difference and um, it is, as I mentioned before, a very important sector. So clearly I've painted the picture there that where um, the advanced manufacturing in Wales is a very important um, part of the Welsh economy, but we also wanted to find out how important it is regionally. We looked previously about employment, just employment numbers, and we saw the ranking table. This time we take it slightly further, and this table that you're looking at is, is the outcome of um, uh, basically a cluster agglomeration study. So for this, we borrowed um, a, or we adopted an approach that was um, first used by Centre for Strategy and Competitiveness at the Stockholm School of Economics. Now they looked at cluster agglomeration uh, based on the rationale that um, the larger a cluster is, um, then the more attractive it is as a region to potential employees. So therefore, somebody is likely to move to a region where there is um, a higher cluster agglomeration than they would another region. Yeah, yeah, the, um, and the result of this is that you benefit from things like knowledge over, labour pooling, as well as inter and industry trade, and the region becomes more um, and so the sector becomes more uh, competitive in that region. So we use their, their approach, which they call it the Regional Innovation uh, Scoreboard, um, and they basically use three criteria. It's all based on employment figures. Uh, they look at the size, specialisation, and the focus. So the size is simply the absolute um, 
number of employees in the sector. Specialisation is the proportion of employment in that sector relative to all other sectors in your, in your comparison region. And the third one, focus, is the proportion of employment, of employment in that region's economy as a whole. So looking at these three, um, we adopted this for the uh, regions of, of Great Britain to see where, if anywhere, Wales uh, came as an important cluster of agglomeration. As you can see on the table, Wales was awarded one star for aerospace. It got the star because it was ranked first in terms of focus. That is, it had the highest proportion of people in aerospace as it was, um, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, and that was at 16%, so it was very high for Wales. Um, so it got a start for that. However, you can see that no other sectors uh, currently feature in that comparison. So what we're finding is, as, as we said before, even though we're seeing uh, advanced manufacturing is very important for Wales in terms of the Welsh economy, its relative importance does fall off a little bit when you start to compete with the uh, UK. So if we widen that out against the European Union, and this is taken from the um, Centre for Strategy and Competitiveness, then uh, what you can see is the top 100 from uh, that study, the top 100 clusters across the European Union in advanced manufacturing, only one region in the UK uh, was awarded a star, and that was the West Midlands for the automotive uh, sector. However, if we look at uh, specific sectors, so if we focus on the aerospace, you can start to see that in terms of employment numbers, that there is a cluster of employment in Wales. And so you can see that even though, um, uh, and if you look on that graph, you can see that there's sort of the re relatively large circle for the, for the um, concentration of people employed in Wales. So whilst it's not on a, on a European Union um, scale, the most competitive areas, as you see the larger blue dots dotted around, it is, it is getting there. With a few more um, thousand employees, it could, it could start to become relatively more important uh, on a European level. Okay, so that was a quick run through the uh, profile of the sector. So the two things to take away from that is that um, the advanced manufacturing sector is hugely important and play, plays a key role uh, in the Welsh economy, and it also is a, it's a high value, added value sector. So the next section then um, focuses on a forecast of skills needs. Uh, we're going to look at three main areas really. We'll I'll take you through the skills gaps and skills shortages that came out of the survey. Uh, we'll then look at emerging technologies, and then we'll try to get on to looking at the demand levels. So this is where we start to try and use that to forecast what the skills needs will be by um, uh, for each of the skills gaps and by occupation as well. So the first thing to look at is uh, skills gaps and skills shortages. Just a quick note on what the difference is between the skills gap and shortage. A skills gap is defined as um, uh, where the current workforce um, does not have the skills it requires to carry out its job as effectively as, uh, as possible. By comparison, the skills shortage is a situation where the labour market does not have the skills that you require for your business. The skills gaps of the current workforce, the skills shortage is of the labour market, so it's where you pull your, um, your employees from. Looking at the graph, uh, the scale uh, is from 0 to 5. It's an average uh, weighted ranking scale on an importance where 0 was uh, no skills gap and 5 was a critical skills gap. So those people filling in the survey indicated uh, which occupation level on the left hand side, so going down from professional engineers, scientists and technologists, at the higher um, skill level of the occupation ladder, down to elementary occupations and labourers at the lower skill uh, end of the occupation spectrum. So at first glance, what you can see is that uh, there are larger skills gaps and shortages at the higher skills levels. So for professional engineers, skilled trades and technicians, skills gaps and shortages are greater. What is also worth noticing as well is that for all occupations, skills shortages are greater than skills gaps. So there's an implication that, um, that this implies that businesses find it more difficult to get uh, employees from the labour market with the skills they require. The situation is not so bad, although we are still seeing that around, uh, an average of around about two and a half to three could equate to a moderate to critical skills gap. Further analysis of that, 
if we look at the next slide, uh, what this is showing us is the percentage of um, people who completed the survey, businesses who completed the survey, is the percentages who ranked um, that they had a cri uh, critical or significant skills gap. So we can see that 39% of the sample indicated that there was a critical or significant skills gap for professional engineers, skills shortage, as I should say, for professional engineers, science and technology. Uh, the equivalent figure is 26% for skills gap. So of the workforce, the current workforce in advanced manufacturing, 25% of businesses said that they had a, uh, that their professional engineers, scientists and technologists required more skills to carry out their job more, more effectively. So again, having a quick glance at that, you can see that the skills gaps and shortages are more critical and more important for the higher level skills, professional engineers, technicians and skills trades less so for elementary occupations and admin and secondary occupations at the bottom of the graph. So, okay, so this reinforces the trend that skills gaps and shortages are uh, more severe for the higher uh, end of the spectrum. Now the report that um, accompanies this, that, that we're trying to present to you, is it's quite a large report, it's about 80 pages, and what we did was we broke down, broke down each of the skills so into um, generic skills, so a group of generic skills and a group of technical skills. The generic skills covered four main areas. They looked at uh, leadership management, business and operations, business improvement techniques and interpersonal skills. Uh, for the purpose of this webinar, I haven't gone um, into those, uh, what the main skills needs are in those, uh, for those generic skills, but of course the detail is in the report that you can uh, go away and read if you're interested. For this webinar, I've just put together, I've just picked on some key uh, sectors to look at what the skills needs are, just so we can illustrate uh, some of the technical skills needs by sector. First one up is aerospace. So if we look, top three skills needs uh, as identified by the sample in the aerospace sector are advanced materials engineering, uh, which recorded uh, an average weighted score. And this is on a four point scale. The last one was on a five point scale. This is on a four point scale. We now have it down. Uh, so whereas four is a critical skills need. Uh, so you can see that um, those three skills that I just read out uh, all have a an average weighted score of over three. So there is a uh, moderate skills gap for those skills. Quickly going through the other sectors, for the automotive industry, new product development and implementation also scores just over three, and then new product development um, at sort of a fan on three. Um, the electronic sector, uh, also around about three, so around about moderate skills need on average for circuit design and quality uh, and control systems with quality control just behind it. This is just a quick run through of some of the skills needs. You can go back through um, the presentation after if you'd like to see uh, some more detail. But it's just to give you a flavour of the depth the survey went into. In the other engineering sector, uh, you can see that material science, thin films and coatings, chemistry, materials science all scored quite a high 3.5 average uh, skills needs in between moderate and critical skills gap um, and then CNC machine operations and prototype development also uh, getting over three uh, on average. Okay so that was a quick run through the type of skills that we're looking at um, for each of the sector this is what um, the business is said to be important. So we'll also have a quick look at emerging technology so we asked the survey sample um, what there were the top key emerging technologies that were driving their business. And the first one, the top of that list, is composite design, manufacture, and repair. Uh, this came out as the strongest. There were also things like the use of robotics, uh, new aircraft design, use of new materials, 3D printing, as also mentioned, powder metal manufacturing, and remote operations. Now, what was a lot quite um, interesting, and I, and I guess a little bit alarming in, in the research that we found, was that 53% of the sample said that they would face barriers in trying to access these uh, new technologies. So just over half of the sample said that they would face barriers uh, in accessing some of these. So when asked why, the things mainly, as you might expect, investment costs, uh, a lack of time uh, to sort of to dedicate to pursuing such technologies, uh, as well as the lack of access to relevant information. And these really were the three key things, three key barriers that people businesses are going to face uh, when trying to adopt these emerging technologies in their business. Also alarmingly then is that 60% of the sample said that the new technologies 
for which we've just found out they're going to face some barriers, 60% said they, they would, these technologies would have a, a highly significant impact on their business. It's quite a worrying statistic when you think that um, there are a long list of emerging technologies that are very important to businesses. Um, most of the sample are going to um, face barriers and there's a high proportion of them that say that these impacts are highly significant. If we look at the change drivers, so the next slide just plots those change drivers. Uh, and it shows on, on a ranking scale again where um, zero is uh, no impact and five is a highly significant impact. So this is looking at what impact these change drivers have on a business. And you can see that new technologies is there in second place and average just over four, uh, which is just over significant. As I mentioned before, 60% of samples said that the impact would be highly significant on their business. Competitiveness is also uh, a huge change driver for the sector that keeps on driving progress. Okay, so that was a quick go through the uh, emerging technologies, as well as covering some of the issues that businesses uh, told us that they face in the sector. Okay, so now that we've seen what the skills needs are uh, and some of the emerging issues, what we wanted to do next is try to estimate how many skills needs are there. So we saw what the proportions of skills gaps were by the various occupations. Uh, we had a quick look through at what those skills were for each of the occupations. So what we then wanted to do was to say, well, that's great. So how, we know how many people are employed, but by 2022, how many people um, are going to be employed in the sector? What is the implication on skills needs for those occupations, for those skills over this period? So to do so, we really did um, uh, three things. We looked at what well, trying to forecast what the change in employment would be up to 2022. Uh, we applied the survey findings to that, uh, and then we made the critical link then between what the skills needs were and what occupations they would be felt in. And then we could start to predict what uh, skills needs would be by each sector. To do this prediction, we used the uh, Welsh Government uh, Commission Working Futures Model. And the Working Futures Model predicts changes in employment for all of the major industry groups that we saw uh, in the first slide for employment, so things like uh, health, construction, manufacturing, and so on. For the purpose of this, we used manufacturing um, as the closest thing to the advanced manufacturing sector. And the um, forecasted change over the period uh, was a negative change of just less than 1% every year. So, uh, so a 0.9% contraction in the number of employees needed in the manufacturing sector every year up to 2022, which was the scope of the, of the Working Futures research. What I um, totals then is my, um, a, a net change of minus 8.6% over the period that we're interested in forecasting from 2015 onwards. Um, the Engineers Forum uh, had a slightly more positive outlook, but they thought that in the next three years there would be a, a zero change, a 0% change in employment numbers. So when we factored the two together, we derived uh, an overall change in employment expected by uh, of minus 6.2% in 22. Um, what this results in is, as you can see on the table at the bottom of this slide, forecast employment, the total at the end, um, falls from 81,400 as it was in 2012 to an expected 76,510, a loss of around 4,900 people employed in the advanced manufacturing sector by 2022. The graph above it then shows where those changes are expected to be felt. So what you can see is the perfectly colour at the top, 2012, uh, and the dark blue is the forecast of 2022. So looking at the different occupational groups on the left-hand side, which again go from higher skills level to lower skills level, you can see that um, professionals, uh, uh, associate professionals, are expected to see, and, and managers, are expected to see um, a net growth. So it's going to be 22% of the sample will be taken up by professionals. So 22% of employees in bulk manufacturing will be professionals in 2022 is currently 19%. So we're going to see some growth in the number of professionals required, the number of associate professionals, the number of managers. That's going to be offset by a reduction in the total, in the proportion of skilled trades or craft personnel required in 2022, as you can see it falls from 25% to 23%. At present, one quarter of all people employed in advanced manufacturing operate at the skilled trade level, um, as you can see on that 25%. Uh, the equivalent 
percentage at the moment is 20% professionals. What you can see by 2022 is that these are going to be far more aligned. It's going to be 22% professionals and 23% skills trades. So there's a general shift in employment from currently uh, a skill trade level and an operative level. That's going to fall off and it's going to be replaced by more people employed at the higher level, at higher uh, skills levels. So doing occupations like professional level or associate professional level. So that's one side of uh, the demand for employees that we're, we're looking at over the period. The other side of it is replacement demand. So what we've done with replacement demand, that is essentially uh, the number of people that are going to be required to replace those who retire, to leave the sector entirely. So to forecast this, we used the Labour Force Survey, which is also available um, through ONS, and that gives you an age profile by occupation group. Uh, so what we did is that assumed that in the next 10 years, anybody currently aged 55 or above is likely to retire. This gives us the total uh, retirement um, number of people uh, from which we can generate an annual retirement rate. Uh, if we apply that to the uh, forecast number of people over the period, then you get a uh, replacement uh, demand. If you Sum the two together, so if you add on the expected expand, change in expansion demand to the replacement demand, then what you get is the net requirement. So if you look at that graph, you can see the net requirement for uh, each occupation of the manufacturing sector. Now, the thing to note from this is that there are three sectors, uh, three occupations, administrative and secretarial occupations, skilled trade craft and operatives where there's expected to be a contraction in the number of people required. So that is, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, over by 2022, there are going to be less people employed in those occupations than there are currently. However, there's a huge replacement demand for them. The largest replacement demand, in fact, is for skills, trades, crafts, uh, and it's just over 5,000. The number is a little bit skewed, sorry about that, but I think it's, it's around about 4,000 um, skilled trade people uh, will be expected to be retiring and therefore will need to be replaced. There's also a very high re replacement demand for professionals. So looking at the net demand then, so despite seeing a contraction in some sectors, you can see that the green graph is positive for every occupation. For every occupation, the net demand is positive, which is a, an important message for the sector um, to really get across that despite there being a reduction in expected a contraction in the manufacturing sector as a whole, there is a net demand for employees in our every occupation. And the other thing to note is that the occupation profile is changing and we're going to see more higher people, uh, higher skilled people. Okay, so what we did then, as I, as I alluded to before, so we predicted the forecast growth. Uh, we saw previously what the skills gaps were. So putting the two together, so we're looking at the proportion of the people that we would expect to be employed by 2022, uh, what proportion of those will there be a skills gap and what will the skills shortage? So for the skills gap, we're looking at the total number of people predicted to be employed in those sectors by occupation in 2022. Uh, the skills shortages, what that is, if you remember, skills shortage from the labour market, so we're interested in the net change in, employ uh, in employment, uh, the net annual change, how many more people each year fill uh, the gap. So if we apply the, skip, the skills gaps and skills shortages that we saw previously to this, this is your result. So what it's showing is that in total, uh, so the total skills demand is around 439,800 to be precise. Uh, total skills need, so that's anybody level of skills gap, but it's a low skills need or a critical skills need. So that's how many people, and it, at just under 55,000 per annum across the period. So for those with critical skills gaps, so that's on the left-hand side, uh, the proportions go down slightly. So uh, there's 110,000 people will have a critical skills gap by 2022. That's 13,800 each year. So if you then look at it by each occupation, you can see that for managers, it's 450 um, managers have uh, each year have a critical skills fill. 3,600 managers will um, have a skills gap each year, uh, sorry, over that period, and it's rising to 29,000 with any sort of skills gap. 
we can also see on the right hand that is that in terms of replacement demand, so the skills shortages, there's 230 professionals are needed each year compared to just 60 skills trades. And now that reflects the change in uh, growth. Um, so there's going to be more professionals needed for the skills trades. However, what you can also see is that of all the occupations, the largest number of um, needs are for the skills trades at 126,000, more than professionals at 107,000. So despite contraction expected, uh, skilled trade people will be employed in 2022, has the greatest skills need, and that's largely because of the replacement demand, um, generating this demand for skills needs over that period. Okay, I'm just checking to see if there's any other points I wanted to make from that, but I think that kind of covers it. So we can see the profile of skills. Uh, so we can also see that higher level skills in terms of number of needed professionals, um, but for skills tra trades, uh, there's still a, a high demand in terms of absolute number of people required with skills. So the final thing then is to put all this together. So we've now seen a uh, forecasted number of people in total. Uh, that needs skills, um, uh, that have skills needs. Uh, we've seen it for occupation and we've also seen it per annum. Uh, this, this graph, uh, this table, what it shows you how you can see the use. So the numbers one to nine there reflect what we saw on the previous slide. And I'll just jump back to it. So managers is number one, professionals are number two, associate professionals are number three, down to elementary occupations are number nine on the standard uh, occupation classification. Jumping forward again back to this graph, the situation group managers at number one, uh, professionals at number two. We've matched that using the credit and qualification framework for Wales to show what skills level uh, relates to those occupations. So you hear me reference the higher skills levels and the higher skills occupations. So you can see how that corresponds now. The managers' uh, skills level is at four, uh, so that's four one above on the CQFW. Uh, so and then as you can see it goes down to three, two uh, and then to one for elementary occupations at the bottom, so that's group nine. What we've got at the top then is the generic skills and I mentioned at the outset we split the survey up um, and focus of the report into two areas, generic skills and technical skills. So the generic skills, uh, leadership management, business operation, business improvement techniques and interpersonal skills. So the skills that you've got listed there are those skills that have a critical or highly significant skills gap. They're basically the most important skills in the skills areas. Same for the technical skills. If you remember back to the graphs I showed you, you would see advanced manufacturing engineering, advanced skills uh, selection and processing, and uh, computer design. So these are the top skills needs in the sector. Uh, the colour code shows uh, where uh, sort of the correlation between the skills, the occupation to which they relate, skills, typically uh, uh, leadership management skills and business operations are more correlated to management. So there's a red uh, box to indicate that they're correlated at a level four plus for managers. So on the previous slide we saw how many managers were needed, it was 450 per annum. Using this we can start to say therefore what training do they need? Uh, you'll see that they need for generic skills, leadership management, that's where the red boxes are things like strategic management, commercialization of innovation, this skills training should be directed for managers. So as you can see in general the generic skills relate to the occupation uh, ladder with the exception of health and safety across all occupations. Looking at the technical skills, um, what you find is that correlation is uh, more aimed towards the professional level. So of those 107,000 skills and needs that we saw for professionals, we can start to say that they're needed in aerospace, advanced materials engineering, computer aided design and so on, falling down the scale. So therefore, if you're a skilled trade, so if you're level five on the occupation group, then this would suggest that um, there is uh, some sort of computer aided de uh, design would be the uh, highest skills need for that, se for that sector. The same thing for automotive, electro, uh, electronics, and other engineering. So the intention is, uh, so the intention is that um, these, uh, this this graph can aid in sort of the planning and, and of of where skills 
uh, development interventions should take place. And as you can see, uh, as a general rule of thumb, there should be more higher level skills aimed at professionals and um, associate professions. There's quite a lot of detail to go through. I hope you're still with me. Uh, the final thing we're going to look at, and I only have one slide on this just to touch on it, because um, it is quite a challenge to look at provider uh, capacity and capability. Um, for the main reason that we can only really look at public provision, so uh, provisions of public funding. Anything that is delivered privately, you just have no way of, um, of, of mapping. It's commercially sensitive data, so you just can't get hold of it. So what we can do is look at um, information that is available um, through the Welsh Government's um, lifelong learning Wales record, um, and we can look at the number of people that are currently learning. So looking at that by as you can see that um, in total there's about 23,000 people currently involved, currently undertaking um, skills courses related to the advanced manufacturing sector. Now these are largely STEM related subjects, that's science, technology, energy, math. There's nothing to say that these people studying this will end up um, in the sector. Uh, they may end up working in other sectors. So we simply can't um, make the connection between the two. Um, what, 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 the only other thing to note from this is that the MVQ um, levels that we see, so the, the largest MVQ um, uh, levels two and three for engineering, um, and it's engineering operations, which is the largest number of people, that's what they're currently undertaking. Um, and that level two and three is at skilled trade level. So what we're seeing is there is currently a sort of a healthy pool of people being trained in MEQ level two and three engineering operations, which as we saw on the um, uh, prediction for the people that were going to be required, it was skilled trades of 126,000 overall that were still needed. Um, and I think, I can't remember what it came out at Pyram, but it suggests that there's a healthy supply of um, People coming out in skills trade. However, what data does suggest is that perhaps um, there should be a shift towards more higher level training uh, to meet the skills gaps and the growing demand for professionals uh, and associate professionals. Okay, that was it. it. Took a little bit longer than I expected. I hope you're still with me. Um, I can see the uh, questions that are just coming in. So we've got a session now. And um, shall we, because we've run over, um, I think what we'll do is, we've noted all the questions that everybody's made, what we'll do is we'll get answers to those questions to you um, after this, this session um, because we have run over by, by 15 minutes. Is that okay with you, sir? Fine, yeah. Okay, so what we'll do is we will get answers uh, to those questions uh, to you after this, uh, after this webinar. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for listening. Uh, the report that uh, this information is compiled with can be downloaded from the Centre Wales website at www.centre.org.uk um, as of next week. Um, and if you have any further questions, uh, please uh, email me at pmorgan at centre.org.uk. So all that remains for me to say is thank you very much for listening um, and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.